morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for coming out this morning. And we're uh, competing with a few exciting things, and it's the last day, but I hope, hope you all can take something out of this. So I'm uh, Joseph Miller from Henry Ford Hospital. And we have Amy Kaji with us from UCLA Harbor, and then Aaron Brody from Wayne State Detroit Receiving Hospital. And we're going to go over how to perform high quality retrospective studies and hopefully give you some tips to take back home for what you're going to do as well as helping your residents fellows or even really just reading reading evidence based medicine so there we go so we'll particularly help everyone identify errors and biases that are present within any kind of retrospective data review or when you're reading any kind of study that's that's done retrospectively. And we'll kind of, the plan here is to really do this more as a workshop together. So I have a little bit of background information here, but the hope is that we're, we're going to get together, kind of go through a study design together in a, in, a, in a workshop fashion and then go through some of the process that way rather than just telling you how to do a study. We'll work together on it. And then we'll critique. Go ahead. And then we'll critique the results as well. So we have a great week to do that. So, you know, I think many of you probably the first study you ever did may have been retrospective, or maybe the first one you're going to do is retrospective. Certainly the first one I ever jumped into was a retrospective study. One of my colleagues, Nikhil Goyal, was interested on whether giving boluses of insulin for DKA patients was associated with higher rates of of hypoglycemia. So I'm like, oh, I was an intern. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll help out. And the next thing you know, I'm like, you know, spending hours and hours looking through these charts of DKA patients back when our EMR was not so hot. Um, so it did eventually get published, but certainly took a lot of effort. And I think I wish I had known some of the techniques that we're going to go through today uh, when we did that. Overall, retrospective studies take up about 25% of all the publications uh, in emergency medicine. And that, that, you know, and I think if you look at the whole house of medicine, it's probably similar or even higher. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, though, is like sometimes retrospective studies are the only way you can test certain hypotheses. There's many things, there's many things in science that we may be interested in where there's no way you can prospectively uh, do a trial. So it may be because it's a very rare event or a very rare exposure. It could be because there's ethical reasons you can't randomize someone to a particular intervention. And so in the end, you have to use data, often retrospective data, uh, to really look at that exposure or that intervention. And of course, there are many advantages to um, doing data collection, or rather um, using chart review methods because the data are already present. It's far easier. Um, and in fact, 50% of EMS research is performed uh, via chart review. Yeah, great points. And pretty, you know, and certainly for the, for our residents, students, junior faculty, it's often the, the you know, for financial reasons, it's kind of the best step into research. Uh, you don't have five million dollars to do a giant prospective observational epidemiological study or an interventional trial. Um, this is actually a figure from a publication from Amy back in 2014 in uh, Annals of Emergency Medicine and kind of not that you can necessarily see every every component here but you know we start with observing data and we hope we're gonna like you know look at chart review and whatnot and get right to the target of what the real data shows but there's all these biases and errors that investigator teams can have which really takes you off track and you miss the target and essentially you know, don't really, the data you collect doesn't really ref reflect what actually happened to patients. Right. The analogy that um, I thought of when we were creating this diagram is, I don't know if you played that game when you were in elementary school, but whisper down the lane or telephone. And so each time you go through a layer, uh, you're adding another level of bias, which takes you away from the truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, and this is something you know I help my residents deal with all the time and which I've dealt with as as a junior investigator certainly over the years is in the end if the data is not being collected correctly and you're not really re the data in your results aren't really reflecting what actually happened to the patients that you're looking back at 
those poor methods end up being many wasted hours for your research team. And then ultimately, journals don't want to publish it is the other issue. And as we'll go through so, you know, some of the, uh, the, the workshops together, the thing to remember too is that many of the, the higher tier journals in emergency medicine will expect a lot of the methods we're going to go through. And if they don't see evidence of those methods, the chance of publication plummets and you may be at an at a open access only journal uh, for, for getting and one, published. One more thing beyond simply the fact that your manuscript may not get published or may get published in, as Joe said, an open access journal um, and wasted time, there's more at stake here. If you come to the wrong conclusions, you know, the reason people do retrospective data, um, retrospective studies is usually hypothesis generating and then someone based on that or you based on that, you know, get a grant into a prospective trial. If it's all erroneous, um, it could lead a lot of people down the wrong pathway, including patients who end up getting the wrong care. So there's a, there's a lot at stake. The tread very carefully because it's very easy. As the, and I hope we don't send the wrong message here, but as you'll see, there are so many, so many areas to make mistakes. There are so many ways that you could go wrong. And again, if it's done carefully, it's great. But if not, there's, it's, it's very easy to just come up with the wrong conclusions. And those can have many, many consequences down the road. Uh, so for Annals of Emergency Medicine, for example, in the instructions to the authors, there is a section on chart review and explicitly states what needs to be performed for chart review methods uh, and for that manuscript to be accepted. And I certainly, you know, as a, ref a great reference for this whole entire presentation this morning is to go back to Amy's, Amy's publication on, on really the methods to how to do this appropriately, which is also ref reflected in those guidelines from Annals. Um, you know, and this is obviously what you don't want to see from your reviewers, and I, I highly recommend a Twitter feed called Blank My Reviewer Said, or, you know, I think it's also under Your Paper Sucks Twitter, Twitter feed as well, but it's just a constant feed of things like this. My favorite here is it's more of a blog post than a research article. All right, so rather than keep going on and on, um, we're going to get, I think, we were planning potentially doing three groups, but I, I suggest we just all to c come together as one group. Maybe we can come more toward the middle here, and we'll work through a study design and talk about the different methods as we go, make it a little more palatable. <laughs>